Welcome to the 11th talk in our series on the Holy Trinity. I'm Father Kenneth Baker, editor of the Homiletic and Pastor Review. And in these past talks, I've been trying to explain to you what the Church's teaching is with regard to the Holy Trinity. Especially in recent talks, we've covered the notions of the processions in God, which lead us to an understanding of the relations that are in God and the persons so that we know that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are relational concepts because they're related one to the other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now in this talk, I want to move on to a notion that to many of you might not be all that familiar with, is the, what's called the mutual permeation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have a special word for that. It's called circumcision which means moving around inside, circumcision. And also the activities of God outside of the Trinity. So far we've been talking about the activity inside the Trinity. What about things that God does outside of himself, like creation, like sanctification uh, through, sending, through his divine grace, and um, the activity in the sacraments and in the church? So I want to talk about that in this talk. Uh, I have tried so far to uh, sketch briefly and clearly the principal dogmas of the Church with regard to the three divine persons. And we have seen that there are two internal activities or processions in God, which are thinking and willing, which give rise to the three persons. And in the last talk, we saw that the three persons are subsistent relations. That is, relations that are really identified with the divine substance. In our experience, all relations are accidental. They are something that happened to a substance, like John is the father of Joseph. That's an accident in him. But in God, the three relations are substantial because they're identified with the divine substance. When we reflect on faith, it is extremely important to realize that there is only one God, but that in God there are three distinct persons, and that they, those three, pers uh, three distinct persons are not three names all for the same thing, but three distinct persons as we would see in this life of John and Mary and Joseph. There's a question then obviously, of both unity in God and multiplicity. We have to maintain both of them, that there's unity in God, there's only one God, there are not three gods, but at the same time there is some kind of multiplicity in God. God is a community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mentioned before that the human family is in its own way a kind of a reflection of that uh, community that we find in God. Now, many Christians, while verbally professing belief in the Trinity, in reality seem to think of God as just one person. So it's a lot of people, they just pray to God. They think of God as one person. But they do not direct their attention to the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, as we do in the liturgy. The liturgy of the Catholic Church is constantly directing prayers to the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. When they neglect the three persons and deal with God as if he were just one person, they are in effect functioning like Muslims and Jews who deny the Trinity. They're not Trinitarians. Our, most Christians are Trinitarians, although some of you have Unitarians, I don't know exactly what they hold, but the mainline Christian faiths uh, of, of Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, and so forth, they are Trinitarian. They believe that there are three persons in one God. So as instructed Catholics, we must be on our guard against this all too common tendency to refer to God as if he were, there were only one person in God, God the Father, and somehow neglect, neglect God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Another common misunderstanding of the Trinity is based on the multiplicity of the three persons. 
Some Catholics think that the three persons are separate, independent beings. In this view, each of the three is thought of as having his own thinking, his own willing, and his own separate consciousness. In other words, they are considered to be similar to three human persons, but only on a higher level and endowed with this divine power. But they think of in terms of three individuals, like they're three gods instead of just one god. Now that view is false and is equivalent to affirming that there are three gods. For in God everything is one where there is no opposition of relation, as we saw from the Council of Florence. A very, very important definition. Thus in him there is only one thinking, one willing, and one consciousness. The three persons share equally in all the divine actions and operations that are proper to the divine nature. In order to stress the divine unity, the fathers of the church emphasized the mutual or reciprocal penetration and indwelling of the three divine persons in one another, like a mutual permeation of the three. We note among human lovers the drive towards union, kisses and embraces between lovers are manifestations of this drive. The highest form among human beings is marital union. The impulse of love towards mutual penetration, which we witness among human beings, is a faint reflection of the mutual indwelling of the three divine persons in one another. St. Thomas Aquinas says that by reason of the undivided divine essence, each person is in each other person in the Trinity. Our Lord says in this regard, in John 14, 10, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. That passage comes right after the section I quoted once before, where Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you such a long time that you don't realize yet that he who sees me sees the Father? That's verse 9 in 14th chapter. Right after that comes, he says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Mutual penetration. He also says, I and the Father are one, not two. I and the Father are one in John 10, verse 30. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the Father and in the Son is indicated in 1 Corinthians 2.10, where St. Paul says, The Spirit reaches the depths of everything, even the depths of God. It's the Spirit of God that penetrates, that knows the thought and the depths of God. The doctrine of mutual penetration or indwelling of the three divine persons was officially taught by the Council of Florence in the 15th century. The Council Fathers declared, and I quote, this is 1442, because of this unity, the Father is entirely in the Son and entirely in the Holy Spirit. The Son is entirely in the Father and entirely in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is entirely in the Father and entirely in the Son. You'll find that quote in Denzinger, number 704. In theology, this mutual indwelling has been called since the 8th century. So that's going back to the 700s. It's called circumincession. Circumincession, which comes from the Latin word circumincedere, which means to go or move around inside to go or move around inside. Circumincession, and sometimes that middle uh, S there is spelled with C, sometimes with an S. Circumincession, moving around inside. The point of the teaching is to stress that the three divine perf persons are perfectly one in being. 
knowing and willing. And that was brought out, as I mentioned, by St. Patrick when he was preaching to the Irish chiefs. He used the shamrock uh, with the three protrusions like that, one leaf, three protrusions. So it's one and three. Or the triangle on the back of the dollar bill, on the greenbacks, you see the triangle there? That's a sign of the, of the Trinity. Uh, it's one, one sign, but uh, it has three points to it. So that there's three in one. And uh, that, that it's perfectly one. At the same time being three, but in a different, three in a different sense. Now I've already mentioned the impulse of love towards union. That's what uh, the thinking takes things in, intellection, whereas willing is a tend to move out, to go out towards the thing that is love. So it's an impulse of love towards union. In the Trinity, each divine person is irresistibly drawn by the very constitution of his being to the other two. They both, they all three share the same divine substance. Branded in the very depths of each one of them is a necessary outward impulse urging him to give himself fully to the other two, to pour himself out into the divine receptacle of the other two. So here we find an unceasing circulation of life and love in the inner life of the Trinity. Thus, since each person is necessarily in the other two, unity is achieved because of this irresistible impulse in each person which mightily draws them to one another. So in a certain sense, this notion of circumcision brings out the perfect equality of the three divine persons. They mutually permeate each other totally and perfectly. In the um, beatific vision, that's where the angels and the saints are, the blessed see and taste the divine unity and beauty. And in this regard, Pope Pius XII, in 1943, in his letter on the mystical body of Christ, paragraph number 80 said, and I quote, It will be granted to the eyes of the human mind, strengthened by the light of glory, to contemplate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in an utterly ineffable manner, to assist throughout eternity at the processions of the divine persons, and to rejoice with a happiness like to that with which the Holy and undivided Trinity is happy." End of quote. So there you have uh, a statement of Pope Pius XII trying to describe in uh, in limited human words, what the activity of the blessed in heaven is uh, in contemplating the divine trinity. So this notion of circumcision then expresses the whole doctrine of the trinity in its own way, that is the consubstantiality of, of the Son and the Holy Spirit with the Father, the distinction of the persons, the processions, the origins, the mutual relations, and the persons. All of those things are brought out by this, this uh, tremendous idea of the mutual penetration of the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I have another point that I want to make in this talk, and that has to do with the activities of the Holy Trinity touching those things outside of the Trinity, that is, creation the world, the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, the angels, human beings, the animals, the plants, everything outside of God. I want to say something about that because sometimes people think that uh, the Father is acting over here and the Son is acting there and the Holy Spirit is acting over here. We want to try and clarify that when God deals with things outside of himself, it's all three persons are involved. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So after explaining, as I just did, what is meant by the mutual penetration of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the next point is to consider the external activities of the three divine persons. If there were no creation, 
If God had not created us, then there wouldn't be any question of this because there wouldn't be anything outside of God. But since in his goodness, he did create the universe and this earth and the sun and the moon and the stars, there are things that exist outside of God, separate from God, sustained in existence by God, but not identified with God. In this regard, the church, basing herself on the testimony, again, of the Bible, of divine revelation, and the writings of the fathers of the church, teaches that all the external activities of God are common to the three persons. So I want you to reflect on that a little bit, that everything that God does outside of himself is common to all three persons. What about creation? All three. What about redemption? All three. What about sanctification through grace that's attributed to the Holy Spirit? All three persons are involved in that. The basic idea here that I'm trying to explain is that God, just like any being, acts through his nature. And the nature is common to all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, everything that God does outside of himself like creation, redemption, sanctification, all three persons are involved in that. It's not just the Holy Spirit sanctifying over here all by himself, the Son redeeming all by himself, the Father creating all by himself. Uh, that is if there are three separate individuals doing three different things. So that's extremely important that the church teaches that all the external activities of God are common to the three persons. I'm going to say more about that now. In other words, no one of the three divine persons can act separately and independently of the others on the created world that they produced acting as a single principle. Creation, the activity of creating, producing out of nothing the universe of which we are a part, that's an activity of the divine substance so all three persons are involved in that. Now in support of this, let me point out briefly that the Fourth Lateran Council in the year 1215 said that the three divine persons are the sole principle of all things. The three divine persons are the sole principle of all things. And in 1441, the Council of Florence declared that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not three principles, but one principle of all things. You find that in Denzinger number 704. A careful reading of the Bible will reveal the same truth. For Scripture often attributes the same activity in the created world, now to the Father, now to the Son, and now to the Holy Spirit. For example, the creation is sometimes attributed to the Father, sometimes the Son by St. John, sometimes by the Holy Spirit. The incarnation, to give another example, of the second person is attributed to the Father by Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. It's attributed to the Son by St. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. And it's attributed to the Holy Spirit by St. Luke in his first chapter, verse 35, and also by Matthew in 1, 20. The same can be said for a number of other divine activities in the world such as creation, redemption, sanctification, and the forgiveness of sins. In the scriptures, sometimes these activities are attributed to the Father, sometimes to the Son, other times to the Holy Spirit. Now, one reason for these statements is to bring out that all three persons are equally active in the creation and salvation of the world. It's not as if 
the Son comes down to become man, and the Father is, and the Holy Spirit are taking a siesta. And then after his resurrection and ascension into heaven, then the Holy Spirit becomes active on Pentecost in the church, and the Father and the, and the Son are not particularly involved. No, all three are involved in all activities outside of the inter interior internal life of the Trinity. Now, the basic reason for saying all external activities of God are common to the three persons is that God acts through his substance or his essence, as I have said, and the three persons possess that substance equally. It's like the shamrock. And one leaf, but three protrusions or the triangle. The only distinction in God, as I pointed out before, is in the internal life of the Trinity, where there is an opposition of relationship that arises from the eternal origin of the Son and the Holy Spirit from the Father. But all three persons are equally identified with the divine substance, and therefore they're all equally God. As we saw in the Athanasian Creed, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But they're not three gods, but only one God. Accordingly, when God acts externally, all three persons are acting in creation, in redemption, and in sanctification, for example. Now, Holy Scripture, or the Bible, very often attributes certain activities to the different persons. Thus, works of power are attributed to the Father, the work of redemption to the Son, and the work of sanctification to the Holy Spirit. These are called attributions or appropriations. These statements of the Bible do not mean that the person in question acts alone and independently of the other two. Accordingly, even though certain gifts are attributed to the Holy Spirit, the actual production of those gifts in the faithful is common to all three persons. So why do the Bible and the church speak in this way? What's the reason for this? Is it not confusing that sometimes it says the Father creates, the Son creates, the Holy Spirit creates? It's not confusing if you reflect for a moment on what is meant. The purpose of these statements is to make manifest the differences between the persons. That is, common attributes such as power, wisdom, and goodness, and certain activities such as sanctification and creation are attributed to a definite person because they have a special relationship to the personal origin and property of that person. So we have what's known as appropriations. And appropriation is defined as acts common to all three are attributed to an individual person. So creation is common to all three, but it's attributed to the Father. Redemption is common to all three, but it's attributed to the Son. And sanctification is common to all three, but it's attributed to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So these things are acts that are common to all three, but are at various points in Scripture attributed to one or the other because of their origin. The Father is a principle without a principle. The Son, because of he's the image of the Father, by, produced by an act of in, intellection, He's the revelation of the Father. The Holy Spirit is connected with will and love. So because of those uh, origins that they have in the internal life of the, of the Trinity, they're referred to differently by Scripture. That's what they, try to, they try to bring that out of the origins of the three persons. And the appropriations make the divine perfections, the many divine perfections, the goodness, the love, the mercy, the justice, and so forth. They make them more concrete. When we consider the divine perfections in their personal representative, 
They are more concrete than when we regard them in themselves as abstractions or in reference to the divine substance, which is common to all three persons. Thus, if I say, God the Father, the source of the divine being, created and gives existence to the world and everything in it, that is clearer and more sublime than if I merely say, God created the world. Likewise, do we not get a more vivid idea of the truth when we are told, the Spirit of God moved over the waters, the Spirit of God animates everything that lives, the Holy Spirit sanctifies and purifies the creature, isn't that clearer than when it is affirmed God moved over the waters, or God gave us life, sanctification, and grace. It makes it more personal rather than general and, I might say, more abstract, more philosophical. It's more personal when it's referred to one of the three persons. Now, it's to be noted that just as the divine nature is transmitted from the Father through the Son to the Holy Spirit, so also the external activity of the divinity is transmitted from the Father through the Son to the Holy Spirit. This does not imply that the three persons act externally in different ways. Rather, it means that all three persons have the same activity, but that they come into possession of it in different ways. Therefore, the external activities of the Trinity do not manifest to us the inner distinctions of the three persons. We can know about that only through positive divine revelation. So that in things that are external to God, then, all three persons are involved, uh, whether it's creation, redemption, or sanctification, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, those things are attributed uh, differently to the various persons to bring out the fact of their origin uh, in the internal life of the Trinity.